Hey, Carolyn. Hey, Marty. How's it going? Very good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, so I just wanted to say hello to everyone out there on all of the different streaming platforms. Last, uh, about last month, we started our Hello Meetup series. And I'm pleased that I have with me here tonight Marty Lurie, who is both a friend and a colleague for many, many years. Um, mm -hmm. I met him first as my solutions engineer um, when I was a customer, and now we work together on the same team. So um, Marty is very knowledgeable about Impala, and I am happy to have him tonight here to talk to you about Impala, to give you all the ins and outs of it, uh, to help you get started. So, Marty, welcome. Do you want to just give a quick introduction? Thanks. Oh. Yeah. Um, I actually just celebrated nine years at Cloudera and was there for the launch of uh, Impala. And I, <clears throat> I must confess, I do have a bias towards Impala. So tonight I get to talk about my favorite uh, SQL solution. But um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Hey, welcome. So to get everybody warmed up, um, we would like to know, so I am from Massachusetts on the south coast of Mass near the Rhode Island border. And we are talking tonight about where are you from and what kind of ice cream do you like? Now, I am a huge ice cream fanatic. We have this really great place um, in Somerset, Mass. It's called the Somerset Creamery. And they have these like amazing flavors. And my favorite flavor is coconut almond. It's like got this coconutty ice cream. It's got these big like giant like chocolate chips in it and giant almonds. So good. Um, so Ma Marty, how about you? What's your favorite flavor? And so I go, I go for moose tracks. Um, moose tracks. That is a good one too. Like the peanut butter and stuff. I yeah, love peanut butter. Because um, I'm actually a chocolate fiend. In fact, um, chocolate is at the bottom of the food pyramid for me, but um, <laughs> cho chocolate ice cream typically just doesn't do it. If I have chocolate ice cream, I have to add a lot of cocoa powder to it. But um, uh, do we have people? Um, I think if you just type into the chat, you can tell us where you are. I'm in, I'm in Boston. Um, actually, I'm due west of Boston. Um, but yeah, if you can let us know where you are and what your favorite ice cream flavor is. Um, can we see that? I don't see a chat coming in, but... Um, Carolyn, do you see any, can you see people's comments? Durham, North Carolina, pistachio frozen custard. I love pistachios. Anything with nuts in it. Love things with nuts in it. Yeah. Peanut butter, pistachios, walnut, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so actually there's an Impala demo that I did for a conference a while ago where I had people text me their favorite flavor to my phone, which I then ran through uh, a lightweight message broker to Kafka, to NiFi, to Kudu, to Impala. I'll actually show you the architecture. Oh, the ice cream and, flavor. And the, this was great. People sent their ice cream flavors. Right up until in the middle of one of the demos, I got a text message from a family member. So um, we we don't do that demo anymore. Um, <laughs> but it was a lot of fun while it lasted. Sounds good. Well, I wish I had some ice cream right now. It's dinner time. We probably shouldn't be talking too much about food. At this point, um, I see folks from Raleigh, North, North Carolina uh, with vanilla and black cherry from Hudson, Mass. I love I love all these things. I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, Stafford, Virginia, mango sorbet. That is good. Ooh, that is good stuff. Excellent. <laughs> all right. All right. Well, shall we get started? Sure. So why don't I share my screen? And you can tell everybody why they are actually here. Um, and that was briefly, you saw Shelby on the screen. Shelby, thank you for all you're doing to, to make everything work behind the scenes. Yes, we have a fabulous team behind us, Shelby and Phil. Awesome. Yep. Uh, thank they you, are Bill. all the smart people on social media um, and are making all of this stuff happen behind the, behind the scenes. Uh, but anyways, the real reason that we're here tonight is for the door prizes. Um, we have some fabulous ones today. We have first place and second place. We got bags, we got shirts, we got jackets, we got water bottles, um, and all kinds of awesome stuff. So 
um, you know, I'm looking forward to this. Um, to giving out these raffles or uh, door prizes at the end of the presentation. But the catch is that you need to participate, right? So, you know, there's no such thing as free lunch, really, um, or free door prizes. Um, you have to participate, ask some questions on um, on the comments section and the various uh, various platforms that you're connecting from. Um, and at the end, we'll do a drawing for them. And then you'll need to send out an email and we'll, uh, to our social media team. Um, and they will send, you know, they'll send out the prizes to you. So it's all good stuff. And it's all fun anyways, asking questions, because that's why we're here to help to help everybody learn new things um, and so that you understand what's going on. So anyways, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to marty because he has lots of stuff to talk to you about so um, thanks carolyn thanks. Marty. and i don't know if you noticed but carolyn is actually modeling the earth air fire water data elements t-shirt my favorite so tonight we're going to talk about impala um and i'm also actually going to talk about sql and big data in general um and per the agenda that we put out earlier um, I wanted to start out with Impala and how it actually works. Uh, there's so many SQL options to choose from. Uh, why is this database different from all other databases? Um, and then, you know, where does it fit? Because if all you need is a little bit of SQL, if you don't have a ton of data and you just need a little bit of SQL and you need some spark on the side and perhaps a garnish of some machine learning, um, is this a good idea. And clearly, I wouldn't have raised the topic if it wasn't a good idea. Um, I wanted to talk about hash joins. Um, for those of you that have been in the database space for a long time, uh, this will be review. But uh, hash joins are really uh, my favorite join strategy and also an incredibly efficient way of joining tables together. And Impala does a, a great hash join. Uh, we'll then load some data and run some queries, um, various ways to load the data from just dumping it right into HDFS, uh, getting data from other databases. NiFi, I think you've heard about NiFi. Um, and there we have a hands-on lab with NiFi. Um, and then various ways to run a query, including uh, Hue, the Hadoop user experience, the command line, various other options. Um, I also have Apache JMeter lined up for you, which is a uh, JDBC test harness. And if you haven't used it, I highly, highly recommend that you do because it's a great way to do uh, multi-user stress testing. And we're going to use it to force Impala to auto scale. And um, then we're not gonna have time, but if we do, we'll talk about uh, Impala best practices. So I also wanted to make sure that this wasn't death by PowerPoint. So rather than saving all the fun demos for the end, um, we're going to just briefly touch on what are our choices for SQL. And then I'm going to go do some of the demo now, and then we'll do some more demo later. But um, I figure the more you get to see things actually working, the more interesting it is. So here are our database engine choices. Clearly tonight, our favorite is uh, Impala. Uh, last time you heard about Hive and Hive on Tez. And there's also Spark SQL. And I figured, you know, it's there we ought to recognize what it's good for and understand where it fits. So let me just go right over and start doing some queries because we can uh, run some an Impala query. Um, and then we'll talk about where these best fit. Um, so I'll come to Impala. And this is the Hadoop user experience. And you can tell that I've been uh, experimenting already. But let me jump up here. Um, and the first one I'm going to do is the bane of the existence for anyone that's ever worked in database. How can you make select star from a table exciting? Well, there's um, the data. And let me get rid of the, um, uh, let's get a little more screen real estate. Um, please, if you would, uh, put into the, uh, uh, will slides be provided? My first question, yes, they will be. Um, I'm going to try to make this a little bit bigger uh, so that you can see it. Um, so here, so yeah, there's no point in taking a whole bunch of screenshots. Uh, the demos are, are not 
I've screenshotted some of the demos, but feel free to screenshot. Um, so what we've done is we've done select star from sample 07. And notice that this is blue here, and that means just run this line. The line ends in a semicolon. If I take this away, then it gets all confused and thinks that this is all one same statement. So we'll keep that there. And we have um, federal job codes, the description of the job code, the total number of employees, and the salary. And the reason why I introduced that is when we do some other queries, you're going to see this data recurring. Um, so now you know what's what's in the database. Let's do another query, which is a little bit more interesting. We have a table called web logs. And you notice I click on web logs, and it expands to a whole series of columns. So if I click run on this guy, um, we get a query. And lo and behold, it's the web logs. But now if I change this to be a marker map, you get to see the thing that I had running earlier. So latitude is latitude, longitude is longitude. Uh, we're going to make it a marker map. And the label we're going to choose is the user agent. <coughs> so let me run this again so that it automatically scales everything. And lo and behold, here's our marker map. Um, California company, nine hits there. Two on the East Coast, surprisingly, 89 um, hits in, in Spain. And if you drilled in, you could see the actual... Um, uh, user um, user agent for, from the browser for that query. Um, but let's keep going because I wanted to show you another query, which, um, you know, so far we've just done a very simple query selecting some stuff. Now we're going to do a four-way join. Um, each one of these tables is a million rows, which for Impala is pretty light duty, but um, so we're joining all of those together and then we're specifying one column to be equal that, to have a value of 500. So let me run this. And the reason why I wanted to run this is to show you, um, well, firstly, that we can blow through um, uh, four tables, million rows each in, um, let's see, it took us 1.2 seconds to do that join. And then this link takes us to the actual plan of how we did the query. And we're going to talk about the uh, database plans in a while. But what I'm going to do here is just scroll down a bit. And remember, I talked about how, how much I like hash joins. Um, you can see if I zoom back that we have a whole series of hash joins going on here. Um, and I apologize for my uh, scrolling. But you can see there's a whole lot of hash joins where we're scanning a table, we're scanning another table, we're joining them, then we're taking that, joining that, we're joining that again, we're doing an aggregate. So a lot of very, very powerful capabilities here. And we're going to go through one of these plans in more detail. So um, hold your votes on that. Uh, by all means, enter questions if you have them. So the next thing I wanted to do was the command line. You can probably tell from my screen that I'm a Linux guy because we're running Linux native. And here we're going to go to the command line for Impala Shell. We're going to run um, basically a similar, uh, similar. no, actually, we're back to the, um, the uh, job codes. But basically, we just ran a, a three-table join. And this is what you can do from the command line. You're probably wondering, well, what's the lowest common denominator? That would be Windows. Um, yes, I did take the picture myself. Um, here's Microsoft Excel. You'll notice that this is empty and this graph is empty. Um, and I'm going to come over here to Data and I'm going to say Refresh All. And lo and behold, here's that same data that you saw earlier, the census data. So here's the job description. Here's the salary. Now. How do you know that this really came from Impala? Well, let's jump over to our uh, Impala web UI. And I'm going to look at the time at 1715. And our last query ran at 1446. So let me refresh this. And uh, we should be up to, OK, 1714. So this is the query that was just generated by Microsoft Excel. And it's a little wordy. 
but let's scroll over to the side. Let's look at the details of that query. And lo and behold, here's the same query plan that we saw earlier. And once again, a hash join. So we'll be talking about hash join some more. Now, for completeness, I did talk about Spark and Spark SQL. So I'm just going to happen to run over to um, the machine learning environment. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to this in a little while, but I'm going to go over to machine learning and I'm going to go into my Hello Impala and I'm going to bring up, um, I have a project called Marty Python. Uh, some of you may see humor in that. I think that's very funny, but I'm going to start up a Spark session here. And um, just for grins, instead of doing it in the... Um, uh, traditional uh, data science workbench environment. I'm going to do it in a Jupyter notebook. And um, I know some of you really like Jupyter notebooks. Uh, what it's doing right now is it's allocating a whole lot of Kubernetes containers. And we'll talk about the Kubernetes and the fact that Impala is now in Kubernetes. Um, and I'm doing this not totally altruistically, because if you notice that we come to the Spark three-way join, um, here's the code, it's the same thing. Select uh, weekday count star from those tables. So these are the, the same tables. Um, and let me go ahead and run this. But you know what? Um, let me, while I'm thinking about it, add in, um, uh, we'll say Spark, SQL, and we're going to say show tables, and then we're going to do a dot take of 10. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and run this. And Spark is uh, creating a Spark session, right? And then once we have our Spark session and it takes a little while to run, then we're going to show tables, and then we're going to do the select and do the three way join. And we're going to print out our uh, start time and our end time. And you notice that this little dot right here is telling us that Spark is busy um, doing its thing. It'll be here in just a minute. Um, and it's not really fair to say, well, this okay, this is the um, you know this is the performance that you get out of Spark. It took 14 seconds to run the query, and Impala it ran the query um, much faster than that. Um, so here I've given Spark another chance to run the same query multiple times. So I'm going to click in that box. I'm going to run it multiple times. Um, and so my Spark SQL is going to do this in about six seconds. It's going to get down to five, but it's not beginning to approach the Impala performance, uh, which you saw was 1.2 seconds. Impala can take up to two seconds or so to do it. But basically, when you're doing SQL, Impala does it faster than Spark SQL. Long way around of saying that. Um, just glancing over for questions. Please, if you would, put any questions in about what you've seen so far. Because what I wanted to do now was give you kind of a, a general rule of thumb as to what to use when. Um, so if you're doing interactive SQL, Impala is the engine to use. When you're doing batch SQL, Hive is the engine to use. If you're doing something that is a little bit of SQL and a lot of programming, that's when Spark SQL plays really well because with Spark, you're pulling the data back, you pull it back to a data frame, you can now go ahead and operate on that in uh, Python or Scala or Java, what, whatever you choose to. Now, you notice that I have these ovals overlapping quite a bit, and that's because when you add LLAP caching to Hive, you can do interactive SQL. And at the same time, and I know, you know the product managers are going to come chasing after me with uh, pitchforks and whatever, but Impala does really well on some batch jobs too. Because um, Impala can scale to hundreds of nodes, and I'm working with a number of um, clients that have their batch running in Impala. Um, now, True, if one of the nodes fails during your batch run, uh, the queries, all the queries in Impala are going to fail. 
But if Impala can run the query and run the batch job uh, five times faster than than Hive on Tez, then you get five tries at getting the, the job to run all the way through before you, you're at a break even for doing your batch on Hive. So there's definitely cases where you can do batch with uh, Impala. Um, and your mileage will vary. And one of the beautiful things about having this job is I get to help you figure out which is the best engine to use. So I get to learn about very interesting use cases. You notice that I've also drawn Kudu here. Kudu is a store, and we'll talk more about the different storages that you can plug in. But Kudu is an insert, update, delete store. So unlike what you may be thinking about for big data, Kudu allows you to actually do updates. Now, last time you probably learned about Hive Acid, and you learned that you can do updates with Hive Acid. It's very important to recognize that Hive Acid is for batch. It's not for individual insert update. It will work, but think about it. Every time you do an insert or an update operation in Hive Acid, you're generating another file under the covers. With Kudu, you've got multiple tablets. You're not generating additional files. Uh, Kudu is able to do those inserts and updates without creating a small files problem. So again, the right tool for the job and looking forward to talking with you about your use case. Now, some of you may think, uh, and actually, hold on, let me just pause. I'm gonna take a quick look at the questions. Um, uh, do I have resource management suggestions for Impala? Thank you, I'm gonna get to that because I'm about to talk about Impala running inside of Kubernetes. Um, does it come with a resource management solution on Cloudera? Yarn is optional. Impala doesn't actually run inside of Yarn, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, would you suggest for big companies that use Impala extensively with BI tools and so many analysts? I intend to show you thousands of queries running against Impala. Um, is your Impala node set up similar to the Spark nodes? Yes, they are. They're all Kubernetes based, and I'm trying to make it a fair comparison between the two. And I'll explain why Impala is better at doing queries, um, SQL queries. By the way, Impala, you know, if you look, if you compare Impala to Spark ML, Spark ML is Spark machine learning, right? Um, and it's great at that. Um, and if you tried to run Keras inside of Impala, we would all have a good laugh and then we'd go do our Keras in, in Spark, right? Um, but if you, um, if you want to run SQL, you know, Impala is a far better tool for running SQL than Spark is, bottom line. Um, please, can you briefly explain hash joins? Thank you so much for asking because that's a few slides from now, but um, I will get to that, I promise. Okay, so some of you may think of Impala as this wicked fast SQL engine that came out a couple of years after Hive that's great for a Hadoop cluster and that's all old news and we've moved to the cloud and why is this still relevant? And that's what this slide is about because a lot has changed at Cloudera. Um, Cloudera, the name started out Cloud Era, as in we thought that everybody wanted to do their big data in the cloud. It turned out we were about eight or nine years ahead of what people actually wanted to do. So if you think about back in 2008, we had Java MapReduce, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. <coughs> um, four years later, we came out with Impala, which is a shared nothing, massively parallel SQL engine. And I'll give you more on that in a minute. Fast forward to beginning of 2020, not end of 2020, beginning of 2020, um, Impala is now fully Kubernetesized. I don't think that's a verb, but I just made it into one. It's K8sed um, and it's running in the cloud. So this um, database engine has the flexibility that you can run it in the cloud in containers um, fully scalable, and I'll show you scale up and scale down. Um, 
This other arrow kind of shows you the evolution of the platform, right? So we started out only on bare metal, you know, two U rack, two sockets on the motherboard, 128 gig of RAM, um, you know, a bunch of spindles, more spindles is better. In around 2014, we first came out with infrastructure as a service in the cloud. And then uh, like mid to late 2019 was our first um, in the cloud, Kubernetes um, uh, cloud offering. So containerized offering. So you can see that there's this, been this huge evolution. And I know that some people, I'm sure nobody here, but I know that some people are still thinking of bare metal Java MapReduce. And there's a bunch of articles that say Hadoop is dead. And I would agree 100%. Java MapReduce on bare metal only, it's history. Uh, fully containerized in the cloud. Um, I think this has this has legs. It's got a long way to go. It's a very, very exciting space to be in. Which kind of brings me to where does Impala fit? Um, so let's assume that you don't have terabytes of data. Um, you don't have a data center, so you can't do bare metal. And you have to do Spark. And you also want to do some Impala and you want to do some machine learning. And the barrier to entry is dramatically reduced by the cloud. So you can go to cloud, but if you go to cloud, there's two major pitfalls. One is I'm going to take my silos that I have on-prem. I'm going to take my SQL engine and I'm going to move it to SQL in the cloud. I'm going to take my Spark and I'm going to move it to Spark in the cloud. And that pitfall, I have this little picture of a, a grain silo. <clears throat> Moving silos into the cloud is not a cloud strategy. It's just replatforming your current silos. The other pitfall, once you've, if you do the, the silo thing, is you end up with, and this is um, my, <laughs> my data movement. Sorry, I see great humor in my slides, and I apologize if you don't, but um, <clears throat> this bus represents shipping the data between environments. So if you build the silos in the cloud, you have to build the data movement in the cloud. And why do that when you can have the same um, single system of record, right? That golden system of record in S3 or in ADLS and coming soon in Google Cloud and have all of these operate on the same system of record. Um, my coding on the fly didn't work. I apologize. But you'll notice here that partition parquet, my Spark lineage, Spark lineage two, Spark lineage three, those tables that I used here to do my Spark queries, and you notice I got six seconds, I got a five second, I got six seconds. Those are the identical tables that I'm using in Impala, right? In fact, you can see here I'm doing a scan on my Spark lineage B, partition parquet A. I'm doing the exact same tables. Let me come back to my table editor, uh, my query editor. I'll come back up here. Exact same SQL, exact same tables, better be the exact same answer, all right? So we have one common system of record where everything is stored together. And then my SQL and my machine learning and my Spark all go to the same place and get the same data. So. You know, I, I used to be on this campaign like we're the biggest, baddest uh, SQL engine in the world and we can, you know, query four tables a million rows each in 1.26 seconds, which we can. But if you don't have billions of rows, it doesn't matter because the ability to have the same single store, um, we'll look at that, uh, having the single system of records, so it could be an on-prem cluster, it could be in the cloud, uh, having the same system of record and having the security and governance. And I'll show you briefly this stuff. You know, tonight's about Impala. It's not about uh, uh, the other topics. But having this layer here to govern everything is super critical. Um, okay, let me pause and check for for questions again. 
because what I'm about to do next is take you back in time to 2010. And sorry, my tablet timed out. So I got to go take a look at, see if there's more questions. And then we'll dive into how does this stuff work? Um, um, I am going to explain hash joints in a little bit. Does Cloudera offer pre-configured VMs that can be used for experimentation? Um, we offer something actually better because if you're running a VM, you've got to have your, um, um, you know, your VM host. Um, we'll actually let you get set up in the cloud so that you can experiment in the cloud, um, and you're um, you're not going to uh, blow up your your VMware uh, environment. Okay, um, so trying to keep an eye on questions at the same time. Let me rewind all the way back to 2010 when all we had was MapReduce and we added this thing called Hive and the Hive Metastore. So what's going on on this slide? By the way, this was when Hadoop dinosaurs roamed the earth. That's what the dinosaur is about. So normally your data center would look like this, right? This bare metal thing down here. Um, and I didn't want to try to draw on top of the rack, so I illustrated my servers as desk side servers. You wouldn't do this, you'd do rack mount, but this makes for a much easier diagram to understand. So what's, what's all the excitement about Hadoop, Impala, Cloudera? It's you have multiple computers working on the same problem at the same time. Um, you can have a co a multi residency, multi tenancy. So you can have lots of things all running at the same time. And when you want to go faster, you just add more of these servers. So, way back in 2010, all we had was the ability to spread your data across a whole lot of servers. That's HDFS. And then you had a mapper, <coughs> a shuffle sort and a reducer. The mapper goes to each server and reads in a bunch of data and generates key value pairs. And the shuffle sort says, okay, all the mappers did all this really nice work for us. Now we're gonna put all the key value pairs in key order. And then the reducer is expecting key value pairs in key order. Now, I believe all of you have written a reducer at least five times in at least two different languages. What's a reducer? It's reading a record. Look at the key. Does the key equal the old key? If yes, increment all the counters, whatever, and read the next row. If no, output all of the things that you've been computing, set the, the old key value equal to what you just read in because it's the new row, initialize the, 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 the values, and go read the next row, right? You've all, you've all written that, okay? So this is all we had before Hive. And some people figured out that there's a lot of people that know SQL and there's very few, few people that know how to write Java MapReduce. So over at Yahoo, they were thinking, oh, right, there's very few people that know how to write Java MapReduce, but there's this new language that we're going to event called Pig, and um, nobody knew how to write Pig either. But um, anyway, they whole other story. But anyway, with Hive, Hive is a, is a program that reads in SQL and spits out back in 2010 Java MapReduce. Now, how does how do you know if you're writing an SQL query, how do you know where the tables are and what the tables are doing? And that's the Hive Metastore. And the Hive Metastore is also critical to Impala, which is why we went all the way back to 2010 when all we had was Hive, okay? The Hive Metastore has a whole lot of entries. It says, this is the name of the table, here's the schema, here's where it's stored, Here's the format, here's the delimiters, the whole nine yards. So Hive, the, the program, reads in SQL, goes to the Hive Metastore, figures out where everything is and how it's stored, and generates a Java program. The Java MapReduce program creates the mappers, the shuffle sort, the reducers, gives you back the answer, and Hive very politely packages it up and gives it back to you 
um, in the format that you're expecting. And I am laughing at myself because I am um, making hand gestures. And I, I don't think you can see me on the screen. I think you just see my, my slides. So I guess I'll stop pointing at the slides. Um, we'll keep using the mouse pointer. Anyway, so that's Hive. That's what Hive does. So this is 2010. Two years later, the, some of the engineers at Cloud, and by the way, Hive has progressed dramatically. You now have Hive on Tez. Tez is super fast. Uh, you can think of Tez as a custom version of Spark designed specifically for Hive because they're both directed acyclic graphs. And yes, I also had to go look that up. Um, so two years after Hive came out, Impala, uh, Cloudera introduced something called Impala. Impala is now fully open source uh, Apache project, top level Apache project. What we looked at was, well, you know, this whole idea of creating a program and then running that program, let's just cut to the chase. Let's write a real database engine. Let's write a database engine that's just like your Oracle, your MySQL, your um, Informix, your DB2 Parallel Edition. Let's go write a real database engine. What's a database engine? And forgive me, I'm taking a lot of shortcuts here. A real database engine takes in the SQL, figures out what the SQL is about, and passes it over to the optimizer. And the optimizer needs to know stuff about the table. And we'll get to that in, and we'll get to the hash join soon because the optimizer has a bag of, of tricks, right? My favorite trick that the optimizer has is we're going to do the hash join. The optimizer figures out what it wants to do, and then it hands off that, that plan, that execution plan, to the actual join engine. Impala uses the same Hive Metastore as, as uh, Hive does. So Impala, because Impala, when we were writing Impala, it's sort of like, well, we don't want to create a whole new Metastore. We want to be compatible with what's out there. We want to be plug and play. We want to be able to go use the same tables as Hive does. Now, for those of you that have been on this journey with me, um, one of the issues that we had in Impala was it didn't pull the Hive Metastore. We were trying to be a good citizen. We didn't want to have a, um, a negative impact on the Hive Metastore. In version 6.3 and in version 7 CDP current version, Hive Impala is automatically doing a polling and all of that metadata refresh is now transparent to you. So some of you I know are celebrating, others of you are thinking, well, of course it should have done that all along and you're right and it does now, so you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so Impala is getting the same metadata, the table definitions, how's the table stored? Uh, what's the table format and where is it stored? And you'll notice that instead of just having HDFS down here, I have Kudu, that's the updatable store. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. I have the regular HDFS and oh look, here's S3. With S3, it means that if we're in the cloud, we get to uh, separate the compute and put it in containers and run it in Kubernetes and have our tables be persistent. And oh, by the way, this is the secret sauce behind the Spark program that you saw inside of a Jupyter Notebook, being able to get to the same table as the Impala that was running inside of the Hue interface, the Hadoop user interface. Okay, so if you wanna think about the analogy, the analogy is take your favorite uh, SQL engine, whatever you're using, you know, be it Oracle, be it Sybase, be it Informix, MySQL, it has a storage layer. Cut away the storage layer and allow that database to go use HDFS or S3 or ADLS as its native store. That's, you know, kind of a mind blowing thought, but that's exactly what Impala does. So Impala will use a massively parallel file, par file store um, for its table store. And again, 
all the magic is in the Hive Metastore because that's where the table definitions are. So while I'm on that thought, let me hop over here and say, show, create, table, sample, 07. All right? So we've gotten a glimpse into the Hive Metastore. And look at this. Uh, it's a Hive managed table. It's transactional. And look at the location. It's in an S3 bucket. The S3 bucket is Marty 37 data, um, which tells you that I built everything that you see here uh, on March 7th, right? The whole environment was built out on March 7th. Um, and if we if we had like two hours, I could build you a whole, a whole, the whole thing from scratch in two hours in the cloud. So in answer to the question, do we have VMs? No, we have something way better than VMs because after we've built that in a couple of hours, then you have full scalability and I'll show you the scalability in a little while. So it's um, in the warehouse table space managed hive sample of seven. This is a directory and inside of this directory are actually files that represent the data that we're going to be querying. Okay, so that's a, a very brief glimpse into what lives in the Hive Metastore. And then in terms of your options for storage, um, Impala can query against HBase, but if you're gonna do that, you really should look at the opera, uh, Cloudera Operational Database because there's a project called Phoenix, and that's really the way to roll with with um, doing SQL against HBase. But Impala has the option to query Kudu, um, Ozone, S3, I need to update this and add an ADLS, and then of course HDFS. And what we're trying to show here is, if you only have massive scans, if that's all you're doing, if you're trying to scan every vital sign of every patient, of every person that had COVID in the world, you can easily accommodate that inside of HDFS or S3 or Ozone, and you could scan all of that and the only question is, how fast did you want to go? Because that's how many nodes we need to add. So that's a massive, massive scan, all right? The flip side of that is over in the HBase land, we're doing an individual row lookup. So I'm going to a website. I'm trying to get a COVID vaccine. Um, CVS wants to give me my next best offer. Uh, I'm picking on CVS randomly. I could pick on Walgreens, pick on any of the, wh whoever owns that website. They want to give me next best offer because all the COVID vaccines are taken. So that would be a lookup, a singleton lookup across uh, what? There's probably 100 million people trying to get a vaccine right now. So we want an instant lookup for 100 million rows. And, um, you know, it's it's a key value lookup. So that's what HBase is good for. Now, in between those two, and by the way, HBase gives you the ability to do updates. In between those two is... I wanna do scans and I wanna do lookups and I want them both to be fast, but I have to do them both. And I'm willing to compromise a little bit on my scan speed and a little bit on my lookup speed, but I still have to be, to use the Boston term, wicked fast. So that's where Kudu fits and that's what Kudu is about. So it's insight, insert, update, delete, faster scans than HBase, faster lookup than HDFS. So those are the options. Um, let me check again for for more questions. Uh, actually, you know what? Let me just do this. It talks a little bit more detail about how Impala runs a query. Then I'll do a question check, and then we'll uh, we'll continue. So our query comes in. Uh, you, you've seen ODBC when I did the um, the Excel query. You haven't seen JDBC yet. You're going to see it shortly when I do the JMeter thing. You've seen the hue, and you've also seen the command line, the shell. So our query comes in, it goes through the query plan, it goes to a query coordinator, and then all of the nodes query the data that they are basically, that they own. And then the result set comes back to the query coordinator and ultimately comes back to the user interface where it started. The Hive Metastore, that's, you know, that's the keepers, <laughs> Keeper of all the knowledge about where the tables are. Um, if we're on HDFS, our name node is keeping track of where the files are. The state store 
is keeping track of all of these uh, Impala nodes. And the catalog server is caching the Hive Metastore for us. Now, something not shown on this chart is you can have just a dedicated coordinator node. Um, so that coordinator node won't be doing any of the query work. It'll just be um, essentially shipping the query assignments to the various nodes and then getting the results set back. Okay, so my next discussion is around hash joins and I'm gonna do questions now. Um, um, you mentioned Parquet, the slide mentions HDFS. What islanding formats are uh, supported and what are recommended? So in general for Impala, uh, Parquet is the preferred format. In our latest edition in Cloudera Data Platform, Impala is now supporting uh, ORC files. Um, Hive historically has been uh, its preferred ORC files. Um, and you get your asset capabilities, your insert, update, delete capabilities with ORC. Um, our engineering teams are working feverishly to get um, Impala to view ORC as a first class citizen, the same as it views Parquet. In fact, um, that'll it, it'll be interchangeable very soon. But ORC and uh, Parquet are going to be interchangeable and equally supported. And for compression formats, Parquet is a really good trade-off between the amount of CPU that it eats and the amount of disk space that it eats. You can get to a much tighter compression with something like GZIP. If you use GZIP, it's very compute intensive. So that means you get much smaller files, but um, when it's time to read them, you're going to need a lot of CPU to, to, um, to decompress them. Now that actually gives you the, uh, it probably plants the idea of, I can have a mixed uh, compression strategy because for the tables that I'm trying to archive, big tables that I want to archive, I'm going to use GZIP because I don't care that it costs me some, some extra in terms of decompression, um, but I'm trying to save as much space as possible. Um, for my tables that I want to have very rapid access, I'm probably going to use something like Parquet. Um, what do I think about HDFS versus S3 performance? Are they compatible? Um, you can't fool the electrons if you have a very short path from your disk to your CPU, you have a very short path disk to CPU. So HDFS is going to be faster. Now, we have worked incredibly hard to make S3 performance, um, again, wicked fast. So you'll see really, really, really good performance out of S3. Um, you'll also see the ability, um, we, we offer you the capability where you can have local HDFS in ephemeral disk. Um, again, there's no way for a, an ephemeral, uh, I'm sorry, for S3 to be as fast as an, as an ephemeral SSD. For those of you that haven't done a lot in the cloud, ephemeral is the term that they use for disks that they're attaching locally. Um, in a bare metal scenario, if the SSD is in the same uh, pizza box, I, I refer to the rack mounted servers as pizza boxes because they look a little bit like pizza boxes, like they're one or two U high. Um, a, a local SSD is always going to be faster, um, but so be it. Um, you're going to get great performance out of S3. Um, I still haven't done hash joins. I promise that's next. Um, uh, are there any plans to connect to Google Cloud Store? Absolutely. We're in beta in Google in uh, Google Cloud, and that'll be coming out very shortly. So yes, 100% support of, of Google Cloud. Uh, please just bear with us while we exit our beta on that. Um, Kudu is not a data format as a storage option file system. Correct. Kudu is, uh, think of it as sitting next to HDFS. It's a completely different file store. Um, so it has its own uh, tablets. Uh, it has its own high availability strategy. It has its own backup strategy. It's not using, um, it's not using HDFS. It's using disk. 
when you implement Kudu in the cloud today, you need to use locally attached disk, and that can be magnetic or SSD. Uh, so in the cloud AWS, the data is in tables located in the cloud object store S3, and in parallel looks at the cloud object store as if it were an internal DBMS file store. Um, sort of, kind of. I mean, it, it looks at the object store. Um, let's go back to that diagram. Um, yeah, it looks at it as if it's just another store. So Impala is looking at Kudu like it's a store, like HDFS, like S3. I haven't drawn an ADLS. ADLS is here, and Google Cloud Store will be over here in this white space very soon. I'm, when I say soon, I'm talking months. I'm not talking, uh, you know, quarters. Um, what kind of resiliency does the query planner have in case of a network partition if it goes down? Is there a secondary? I don't want to answer that on the grounds that it may incriminate me. We have really good restart on on the um, on Impala. Impala is not HA, right? If you have to have a batch job in a fixed window um, because that's your production nightly batch, then you want to use Hive, right? Uh, Impala is um, very reliable, very scalable, but it does have single points of failure. My apologies. Um, there's some things that we just can't easily solve, right? Because we have, um, in fact, let me do the, I'll do the memory space thing in a minute. Um, around um, uh, how a hash join works, and then we'll talk about how you can't take that hash join memory and propagate it across the cluster without basically bringing the cluster to its knees. Um, why does Impala not support the date type partition column? Um, and sorry, your query. Thank you. What is the specific reason behind that? Um, um, so the, the honest answer, which is also a little bit flippant, and I apologize, but the honest answer is they didn't, they didn't write that in the code. Um, you know, they, they chose to implement a bunch of things, and that's one of the things they didn't implement. If that's something that's really driving you nuts, um, send me an email. Um, I don't know who you're working with from Cloudera, but by all means, send us all emails. Uh, my email is marty, M-A-R-T-Y, at cloudera.com. Um, and if that's something that you absolutely have to have, um, I will campaign for that. Um, there are uh, there are a few things in Impala that I can point to and um, very proudly say that that changed because one of my clients needed it and um, the product managers hate me, but we finally got it implemented. And the whole um, uh, polling of the meta store is one of the things that <coughs> I've literally been fighting for. Um, for about, well, since 2012. <laughs> um, so if that particular data type is something that you absolutely have to have, uh, let's go after that and let's go after product management for that. Um, okay, I'm gonna do hash joins now. Um, I promised the organizers um, that I would be done uh, before an hour and a half. And we blocked the time for questions and I'm trying to take questions real time as they happen. So I'm gonna keep rolling unless somebody pulls my internet connection to stop me. And I'll keep taking the questions as they go. So if you have questions, put them in, I'll do them real time, but I'm not gonna save a block at the end for questions. So uh, please don't count on that question time because uh, we've got a lot more interesting stuff to do. All right, hash joins my favorite subject. And I'm looking at the chat and, and uh, the people that um, the organizers are not telling me that I can't do it that way. So we're gonna keep rolling. Hash joins. This is, I think the best join strategy um, that any database has, and you'll see why. So we have on disk, and I've only drawn two tables, right? And we'll flip back and forth to the, the uh, explain plan. We have two tables here and we need to join these two tables together. 
And let's just hypothetically say that this table on the right has 10 billion rows and this table on the left has a million rows. And what we're going to do, hash join has two phases. The first phase is we scan one table into memory and we look at the primary key of that table or the key value of that table. As you know, except for uh, Kudu, we don't have primary keys, right? We, we can have a key value, but uh, Kudu tables have primary keys. HDFS tables do not. S3 tables do not. We also don't have any indexes. And oh, by the way, when we get to performance, um, you'll see that we don't really need indexes or primary keys. We can go as fast as we need to without them. So here's our 10 billion row table, and we're going to scan that into memory. And you're looking at this and you're thinking, Marty, you're out of your mind. Why would you put 10 billion rows into RAM um, and spill to disk because you're going to run out of space um, when you could put a million rows into RAM, right? A 10 billion row table or a million row table. And that's because we have a cost-based optimizer. And the cost-based optimizer is looking at these two tables and it's saying, oh, look, if I apply the where clause to my 10 billion row table, my 10 billion row table reduces to 100 rows. So I'm going to put 100 rows into memory. And once I build this, right, I look at the primary key, I create a hash value on the primary key. That's why it's called a hash join, because I'm looking at the key, I'm creating a hash on it. It has to be a very lightweight algorithm, and it has to give a very unique value. Pardon me while I silence my phone. Um, it has to create a very unique value. And um, once I've built all those hash values, I've got a hash table in memory. Now I go to my probe phase. That was my build phase. Now I'm in my probe phase. I go to my million row table and I only have a hundred rows in RAM. And I scan this million row table. And for each key value, I use the same hash algorithm. And when the hashes join, uh, when the hashes are equal, I have a join and I keep that row and I'm a happy camper. Now, there's a massively parallel database. I won't mention any names, but they didn't understand how hash joins really worked. So their total hash space was 2048. In other words, the total number of hash keys they could generate was, two, it was 2048 hash keys. Of course, they got horrible performance. And they tried to compensate in a whole lot of different ways. But ultimately, you want this hash space to be very big and very sparse. Now, let's go back to this problem around where do I start? 10 billion rows over here, a million rows over here. Let's jump back to the actual query that we ran. And you notice that uh, I've got all these tables and I have a where clause. So I'm going to run this guy. and. Um, I have a whole nother talk about optimizing Impala that I'm not going to really get to, but I, I will jump to one chart there. Here's my plan. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. And um, I wonder if I can get rid of this. Yeah, I can get rid of that. Okay, so here's my plan. And you can see that I started my hash join. By the way, the way to read this is Here's my very first scan. Um, you notice it says exchange. That means that I'm um, sending the data to all of the different nodes, okay? Broadcast, because I, what I'm scanning in here is small enough that I can broadcast it everywhere, all right? How small is small? Well, let's go up and let's take a look at my summary, and it tells me that my... Um, total amount of data that I've scanned in is really small. I'm going to show you that on it because it's a little, I'm run, I've run out of real estate. So I'll show you that in a different spot in a minute. Um, so here's my, my scan. Now, remember, this is our first scan. This is what we're loading into memory. So this is what we want to have as small as possible. Optimizer knows which is, which is the small table. Let's look at the plan because it's got table statistics. 
And you'll notice here this warning. The following tables are missing relevant table or column statistics. This is the easiest thing you can do to take your problem queries and make them go dramatically faster because the optimizer has to figure out which is the smaller table. If the optimizer chooses the 1 million row table instead of the 100 rows, it's in a world of hurt. It's still going to get it done, right? But it's in a world of hurt because it's dragging a whole lot of more um, stuff into memory than it needs to. So I'm going to jump way ahead to um, this is a live example. And you notice that I faked out the optimizer by killing statistics so that here it did the right thing. It pulled in the 100 rows and then it probed with a million rows. So I only had 100 rows in memory. I did some nasty tricks and I forced it to load up a million rows instead of 100 rows. All right. The difference here in performance is dramatic. We get support tickets. <laughs> the answer to the support ticket is compute stats on the table. Now, what does that look like in reality? It's not an arduous thing to do. Let's come back to our, um, uh, you notice here I said drop stats, Spark Lineage 3. All I have to do is say compute stats my Spark Lineage. And it should have found that table if I spelled it right. Sorry to make you watch me type. So if I do this, takes a little while to do, right? But the amount of time that we save by 2.5 seconds for a million rows, the amount of time that we'll save on subsequent queries is huge, okay? So that's hash join. And let me go look at questions. Um, uh, you like the graphical user interface. That's awesome. Good, thank you. Um, I, did, I had nothing to do with writing it. In fact, I had nothing to do with writing any of this stuff. Um, in fact, if you look at my speaker bio, it says I play with computers for a living. Um, if you do the hash join really well, you get bragging rights for top price performance. And I deliberately took away the other names because I'm not trying to diss anybody. But bottom line is, from a price performance standpoint, Impala is just rock and roll. Um, and this is a, um, a third party. This isn't our benchmark. This is a third party's benchmark. Now, price performance, probably the most important thing that I'm going to say tonight. Um, if we don't have a business case to drive a use case, to drive a project, we have a science fair project. I love science fair projects. I'm sure many of you have some, something resembling a Hadoop cluster running in your basement, guilty as charged. Um, but the science fair projects are not the day job. So, um, you know, when I first came to Cloudera, it's sort of like, well, oh, oh, look, we've got Impala, we've got Hive, we've got uh, Pig, we've got Zookeeper to keep all the animals in line. Um, this is, and it all runs on Linux, and you can tell from my desktop, I run Linux native. Um, and about, well, it took a lot longer than it should have, but probably less than a year. And I figured out if we're not making money for a company, saving money for a company, or in the case of COVID saving lives, um, then it's a science for a project. And, um, if we're making money or saving money and we're doing this based on a business case, um, the barrier to entry is dramatically lower based on using cloud, but there's still a financial barrier to entry. And we wanna make sure that, you know, the return on the investment that you're getting is dramatically more than you're spending because otherwise there's absolutely no point in doing it. So um, if, if you don't have a, a business case, um, again, talk to me if you've got ideas, that you, something that you think might be a useful business case, about two weeks ago, I did a talk on um, machine learning and trying to map logistic curves. And it's funny, I just drew a logistic curve in the air with my hand, which you can't see. But um, trying to map logistic curves to predict 
when um, COVID would be over. And I found a, a, a referee paper at the National Institutes of Health and these poor um, researchers published back in June of 2020, and they were confident that COVID would be over by uh, November, December of 2020. And, you know, the machine learning was excellent and the curve fitting was, was done really well. And I was able to generate a whole lot of synthetic curves and replicate the curve fitting that they did. And then we figured out that we're dealing with human behavior and COVID is nowhere near over, but there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So um, let me check questions again. I don't see any new questions, so I'm gonna keep rolling. Um, rather than going into detail on how to build a table, let me touch on a couple of other things that are really interesting, and then I'll wrap up on the JDBC interface. So, um, when you're looking at the different tables, it's really uh, worthwhile to be able to know where they came from. Excuse me, my uh, Jupyter notebook timed out, my apologies. So let's come back to here um, and let's go to our, um, our catalog and look, look at the tables that we have. Um, and I just wanna look at the hive tables and I'll look at partition parquet, which is what I kind of built a lot of other things on. And you can see that um, partition parquet started out as the stage table and then was combined with the directory partition parquet and became a table unto itself. And here's the schema for that table. And here's my metadata audits. Um, so it's really good to have a catalog. And remember way back when I talked about how, um, well, actually let's jump back there. I talked about this layer. Um, this is a really important layer to have because you can see the lineage of where the table came from. And again, you have access to the same table across all of the different um, environments, the Spark, the Impala, the works. Um, what else do I have for you? Um, so we already did Hue, and um, the way you can get to Hue if you're in the cloud is you come over to uh, Data Warehouse. You can see that I'm currently running two nodes. I click here and I say open Hue, and that gives me Hue, which we've been using all along, right? And oh, by the way, my previous queries are here in query history. Um, I haven't saved any queries in this particular instance. Um, but while we were there, and because I, I didn't show you this yet, um, we have this new thing called um, Viz, Cloudera Data Visualization, and it gives you dashboards. And so you can have interesting dashboards like uh, global internet threats. And um, this shows you who's, um, who's, <laughs> investigating whom, right? So, you know, the US is going after everybody. Some of these other ones are kind of interesting though. Like you wouldn't think uh, Mexico, uh, Australia, um, a, lot, a lot of interesting things going on. So you get these, these visualizations. Um, and what I wanted to show you was if we go back to home here and then we go to, we'll make a new dashboard and I already configured Marty data source. So we're gonna do a new visualization. And I showed you the, this data earlier, right? The job code, the description, the total number of employees and salary, because I wanted you to recognize this when it came up. So this is the same data that we have happily living in uh, S3 available to everybody, but we wanna do something interesting. And you, there's tons of visualizations here, but the one that I've, be played with most recently is the word count. So I'm going to take the description and make that dimension. And then I'm going to take the record count and make that the measure. And I'm gonna say refresh. And lo and behold, we now have a word count of all the different job descriptions 
that you saw in the U.S. government table of uh, different jobs. I think that's, you know, the sky's the limit on the visualizations, whatever you choose to do here. I think I can make this bigger. Um, yeah, so there we go. Um, and um, wh whatever you care to do here, uh, I welcome you to do it. And again, this is lowering the barrier to entry for you being able to get to this kind of visualization very rapidly because we've implemented this in the cloud. Uh, next up, um, oh, remember I told you about the um, example where people sent me text messages and they ended up as marker a marker map and also for machine learning. Um, here's an example of vanilla ice cream coming out of somewhere in New Hampshire. And that's the phone number of the person that sent it. And again, sorry, I'm not doing that demo anymore because of the messages that I got from um, my, my family member during the demo. Um, we did the visualizations. <coughs> we've done command line access. Um, here we've done a query against S3. This actually is showing, this was a query that I did from my local workstation. So that's on-prem at my house for the last year with COVID going to the cloud in S3. But now we get to JMeter, which is multi-user. And let me pause before I do JMeter and see what I've got for new questions. Um, uh, no one expected people to run towards the zombies during the apoc apocalypse. I assume that that means relative to the COVID that nobody expected um, the parties. And you know what? Nothing good from, can come from me making a, a politically, making any kind of a political statement, so I won't. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going there. Um, I personally would like to get a vaccine, and I respect anyone and everybody's opinion to, to reserve their own opinion, but I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine. Um, but I don't want, I don't want any, to anyone to come away saying, Marty said, X, Y, Z about um, anything political. So we won't go there. Let's talk about JMeter. Um, JMeter is a multi-user testing harness. It's fabulous. It gives you um, as many streams as you want. And we're going to use this to um, query Impala. I first learned about JMeter um, when I was learning about um, uh, the internet because it's that old. And um, I was thinking, wow, this is really neat. I'm driving to work and I'm thinking, this is really neat. I can, st I can stress test and see what kind of performance uh, Yahoo can deliver. And as I'm driving into work, I heard on the radio that Yahoo and a bunch of other sites were down because of a denial of service attack. And I was very fortunately able to connect the dots and say, you know what? If you're going to use JMeter, you'd better use it against something that you own. Because if you use it against something you don't own, you're going to be in big trouble, right? I was I, I was essentially going to go to the office and launch a denial of service attack unintentionally, but a denial of service attack against um, uh, Yahoo. So I didn't obviously I didn't do that. But what we're going to do is we're going to launch a whole bunch of queries against Impala. And you'll notice I recorded this ahead of time because if it fails, um, it's going to fail spectacularly. And I wanted you to see that Impala can scale from two nodes to four to six. Here we have eight nodes running because of the workload that I added with JMeter. So we're going to JMeter. I have it running now with a very low frequency workload. So we can see that uh, it's a JDBC request. The request is select sum of salary from sample of seven. Um, and I'm going to stop that, and I'm going to bring up the monster query. So we're going to open up uh, for force auto scale. And this is really nasty. And don't do this, because it's not a meaningful query. Um, 
select some of Sally from sample A, sample B. There's no join clause. There's no join between the two tables. So this is going to, for every table here, generate one table there. Okay? So this is a really bad thing to do. Please don't do this. However, for what we want to do, we're going to go launch a thread group, 400 users all running that query because we want to stress out Impala so badly that you would think, oh, it's going to break. Well, actually, no, it's not going to break. What it's going to do is it's going to start adding Kubernetes containers. You notice that it's coming back pretty quickly. It's going to be adding Kubernetes containers to scale up. I'm sorry, Kubernetes um, with Docker containers inside of Kubernetes, Kubernetes pods to scale up to run the, the, um, the queries that I'm requesting. So let's go jump over and let's watch the, the uh, scoreboard live as it happens. And actually, I already had it open here. So right now, we're at two nodes. And in a minute, this is going to jump up to more nodes. Now, somebody asked earlier about, do we have resource uh, controls over this? And absolutely, we do, because we can specify how long, once you're overloaded, before you scale up. Hey, look, we just got to four nodes. See that? Um, well, you can see there's a little step function. There's a step function. Now, let's also go watch our scoreboard because this is, we're spending money. And by the way, the organizers have um, been really kind to me and they've let me have an uh, EC2 account where I can spend money. Um, so I'm going to my EC2 dashboard and you can, we'll run over here to running instances. And let's come over here to uh, launch time. And it's actually not launch time, it's dinner time. 8.17, right? That's our launch time. It's currently 8.17. We just launched these two new servers, all right? I'm gonna refresh this and we'll go back to launch time. And we have um, another one launched, and there's going to be, yeah, they, they come in pairs. Um, so we'll jump back over here. And if I refresh this, actually, I don't need to refresh this because this is incrementing um, over time. So now we're up to four nodes. In a second, we're going to see that we get some additional nodes. All right. So uh, JMeter is pounding on Impala, which is not a very nice thing to do. Let, let me hop over for a minute and show you one other place where you can keep score, because here's our workload manager. And you can see that historically, um, we're going to go into my environment. Uh, think of the different environments as charge cards. You can see that historically, I've done 41,000 queries in the past, what? day. Uh, let's go look at the last 30 days. Um, and by the way, this lags a little bit. This is not a real time, so we're not going to see a sudden spike in, in stuff. But in the last 30 days, you can see I've done 160,000 Impala queries. And Bill, I promise I will turn everything off when we're done. Um, I've done six Spark jobs. I can see my failed jobs. I can drill in an Impala, and I can see this. People are actually using this to figure out uh, how to optimize uh, moving from the cloud because what we do is really hybrid. We're on-premise, we're in the cloud. Um, if you're just starting out, uh, again, and you don't have, well, even if you do have terabytes of data, you know, we can store that in S3 for very short money. Um, but if you're on-prem today and you're looking at moving to the cloud, this um, workload manager can help you figure out what you want to move to the cloud. We can see our queries by duration. We can see our problem queries. Uh, this is a problem query because when we flood Impala like that, Impala has some governors like a, a admission control. And so it's going to reject queries beyond a certain level. That's another resource manager that we have. Um, here's our resource consumption. Um, let me just run all the way down because I think I've showed you most of the cool stuff that I wanted to show you. We didn't talk about governance topic for another day. We talked about workload manager. 
Um, I think I'd better stop so that we can give away um, some things in a raffle. Um, and let's see. Uh, everybody can agree on J-Meter. Thank you, True. There's nothing politically charged about J-Meter. How about scaling back down if you were to stop the number of threads? Very good question. I'm going to stop J-Meter right now. Um, and you notice that I've overloaded sufficiently. I may have broken things. Uh, so let's clear everything out and see if we're getting anything green. We're getting a lot of errors. Um, oh, there's a green one. So we're rejecting queries because we may have reached our maximum scale up. Um, so let's run back over to our scoreboard. Uh, we're at six nodes. I know we can get to eight, but we're out of time. So let's stop this. And you notice that it's going to take a while to shut down the threads. Um, but by the time we give away all the raffle things, we're going to um, uh, we'll probably have tuned this down. And you'll see it scale down. If we don't see it on the live dashboard, um, that's why I did a screen capture. Um, you can all handle the truth, which is why I'm willing to take risks about things not working exactly as I say they will. Um, here's JMeter. Um, by the way, here's the JDBC configuration. Here's the scale down. Here are all the instances that were terminated. And here's the graph that shows we went from eight further down. OK, so um, I think I put up the raffle. And nobody's in the raffle. Everybody's in the raffle. Beautiful. Um, hey, Marty. OK, Carolyn, thank you, because I didn't know what happened next on the raffle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it is time to choose our raffle winners. OK, I think I get I get to do that, don't I? You do. You get to do the fun part. That is the fun part. Getting to excellent the winners. Excellent. So okay. I had, I had meant to queue up like a YouTube video that has a drum roll, but I I don't have that. <laughs> I assume everybody preferred that I get one more demo done. Um, so do I do I click uh, choose a winner? Choose a winner. Okay, so this is for first place. First place, yay! And right. I believe that you are choosing from the following things, which are all very, very nice. Yes, very nice. Um, the uh, modeling the air fire water data T-shirt. Okay, so right, I'm going to say <laughs> very carefully choose a winner. Choose a winner. And our winner for the first package is Sim Sundaram. Congratulations, Congratulations Sim. Sim. Yeah. Very nicely done. All right. And I, I was thinking of using JMeter to put my name in over here, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I never figured out how to do that. So let's go to our second choice, which is um, T-shirts. Or yes. the, the uh, water, water bottle, bottle. Yep. Water which bottle is spray. a beautiful water bottle, glass with a, a wooden lid. Or the um, uh, JBL, this must be Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. uh, clippable. That's OK. Tunes so, on the go. Um, so what, does this make me Vanna White? Uh, <laughs> anyway, here we go. I'm going to choose here the next go. winner. Two. <laughs> Mitesh. Oh, Mitesh. Mitesh, you're the winner. So um, if the winners could um, email social media at cloudera.com, um, they will send out all of this lovely swag. And I want to thank everyone for attending tonight. This um, The slides will be up and the recordings will be out uh, if you you know, if you have friends that missed it, if you want to watch it again, they'll be, uh, the recordings will be out. And I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to our presenter, Marty Lurie. Um, awesome job, Marty. Thank you so much for, for giving us all that great information about Impala. 
Um, and also to our fabulous social media team, Shelby and Bill. So um, I think we're going to wrap it up from here. So, and Karen, one oh, last thought. Yep. Uh, one of the questions was scale down. Oh, right. Yeah, let's see about Remember the scale down. Remember, we turned off J meter, and here's our scale down, real time. There and it is. if we jump back to um, my AWS account, um, and I, you see instant state running? If I ask to see the instances that are being terminated, uh, where'd they go? There's a bunch of instances. <laughs> uh, oh, maybe I need to refresh. Um, so I assure you that those instances are terminating. And again, in the slide deck, I have a pick. So the instances take a little while to turn off. Once we were, remember, we're doing Kubernetes uh, pods. We've got Docker containers. When we decommission those nodes, we've got to decommission the Docker, the Kubernetes, and that, then and only then can we kill the instance. So I'll take one more refresh here and instance state is still running. I apologize. If, if we could hang out for a few more minutes, you would see uh, something that looks like... Um, uh, this instant state terminated. So all of those things, and you can see that we're using the Amazon EKS. And sorry for, for going into the bonus round. We're still three minutes early. I'm finishing. Thank you, uh, Carol and Shelby, Bill. Thank you all for attending. You probably can tell that I love talking about this stuff. So thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about my favorite database engine. Yes. And we will be having more meetups in the Hello series. So uh, stay tuned to our social channels and also to the meetup.com site. Uh, we'll be having announcements about all of the upcoming meetups. So we look forward to seeing you soon. And I uh, hope you guys have a great night or day, depending on where you are in this time zone, in this virtual world. Have a great night. Take care, all.